Master of Standards. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Let's illuminate. Welcome to Illuminate, Lighting Your Health and Safety. My name is Azel Francis, and today I am joined by Nadita Ramachala, Manager of the Standardization Division at Trinidad and Tobago, and Michael Bender, Director of the Mercury Policy Project. Um, today's conversation is going to be a 15-minute quick fire discussion about the health and safety risks posed by mercury containing fluorescent lighting. LED light bulbs are generally safer for our communities, and this conversation will explore the health risks of fluorescence, how to clean up and properly dispose of our broken light bulbs, and also the advantages of mercury-free LED alternatives. So welcome, Michael and Edita. Thank you. We will <laughs> jump right in. Um, so we'll start off first with you, Michael. Can you share with us a little bit about the types of lamps that contain um, mercury? Sure, and, and thank you for having me. Um, all fluorescent lamps contain mercury, and mercury is present in lamps in both the phosphor powder and in the vapor. Depending on the type of fluorescent lamp, they can contain a wide range of mercury from a few milligrams up to 100 milligrams or more. Compact fluorescent light lamps, or CFLs, contain around four to five milligrams of mercury, the amount of mercury that could fit on the tip of a ballpoint pen. Mercury in, is also in linear tubes, including T5s, T8s, and T12s, and generally contains between five and 10 milligrams of mercury and are often, often used by businesses and institutions. And then there are high output fluorescent lamps, which are used in warehouses, industrial facilities, storage areas where brighter lighting is necessary. Whereas cathode, cold cathode lamps are small diameter fluorescent tubes that are used for backlighting in liquid crystal displays on a wide range of electronic equipment, including our laptops. In addition, high intensity discharge lamps is a term commonly used for several types of lamps including metal halide, high pressure sodium, and mercury vapor lamps. HIDs are typically used in street lighting, parking lots, stadiums, and warehouses. Other types of mercury added lamps include ceramic, metal, halide lamps, high pressure sodium lamps, and mercury vapor lamps. While the amount of mercury per bulb is generally very small, the total amount of mercury in lighting adds up quickly with a sheer number in circulation. Wow. Um, I had no idea that so many lamps contained uh, mercury and that there are so many types of lamps. But the average consumer, when you think of lighting, you don't really think about lighting uh, having an effect on your health or your safety. So Nadita, can you share with us a little bit about that link between lighting and your health and public safety? So we are speaking about compact fluorescents, and we all know that they contain an element of mercury. Mercury is a toxic chemical, and it can have a serious effect on, you know, vulnerable populations like infants. So as we set standards, we want to ensure that there are safe lights and products available for use for the consumer. The consumer would, you know, typically look at the electrical parameters associated with a bulb and our role as the Trinidad and Tobago Bureau of Standards would be to set requirements that cover safety, health, environmental protection. So lighting is very fundamental because if you can't see properly, it can contribute to hazards like slips, trips, and falls. So when you are designing lights and purchasing lights, you have to be able to make an informed decision. You know, you want a bulb that lights properly. You want to know that it is bright enough you want to know that it will last long enough. So it is a balance between safety, health, environmental protection. And more recently, uh, energy efficiency has come to the fore. So we have also been looking at regional standards and national standards that cover the energy performance of CFLs and LEDs. 
So we'd want to ensure that the information is available to the consumer to make sure that when they purchase lights that they utilize the appropriate level of lighting to minimize any health and safety issues. And in particular, you know, the bulbs are glass essentially. So we'd want to ensure that there is minimum disruption if, for example, a CFL breaks and then mercury is released into the atmosphere. So there's a significant So we need to be cognizant of all these different parameters as we purchase bulbs as the normal everyday consumer. Thank you so much for that. And Nadita mentioned this idea of risk to babies. Uh, Michael, can you share a little bit more about who would be most at risk from breakage of mercury added lamps or fluorescence? Yeah, I, I would be glad to. Um... I want to just start out by explaining that in the United States, there was a study conducted by the state of Maine uh, that examined mercury breakage from broken lamps. Among other findings, it reported that in a single CFL, the mercury concentration after breakage in the study room area often, often exceeded the Maine ambient air guideline of 300 nanograms per cubic meter with short episodes above 25,000 nanograms per cubic meter, and in some cases, even above 50,000 nanograms per cubic meter. In most cases, a short period of ventilation was sufficient to significantly reduce the concentration of mercury in the air. However, depending on the circumstances, for instance, as simple as foot traffic on a contaminated carpet, the mercury air concentration sometimes rebounded, especially if the room was no longer ventilated. Based on the latest research, our study identified those subpopulations of most concern from exposure to mercury. Those most at risk include infants and toddlers and also uh, pregnant women and the developing fetus who are most likely to be exposed to mercury vapor when a lamp breaks, especially in an unventilated area. Uptake of, uptake of the mercury vapor in early life not only results in high higher relative dose in, in adults, but also increases the risk of developmental disabilities. We also are concerned about workers who handle fluorescent lamps, not only at manufacturing and re recycling or processing facilities, such as in the case of bulb, bulb eaters and, and the compacting uh, and consolidating the, the CFLs, as well as maintenance workers in commercial and institutional buildings including offices, schools, hotels, hospitals, and apartment buildings. In many cases, workers are unlikely to be informed about the risk and the appropriate safety measures to reduce exposure. And I will go into more of those, those safety precautions later. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. So for the average consumer, when we're using our light bulbs on a day-to-day -day basis, what are those precautions that we should be taking as we dispose of our light bulbs? Um, and we can start with you, Michael, and then um, Nadita, if you can chime in. Okay. Uh, again, uh, what, what we're seeing um, in the U.S., our federal agencies uh, have Put out fact sheets uh, highlighting the challenges of protecting the most vulnerable populations from lamp exposure, uh, uh, mercury exposure from lamp breakage. For example, in the U.S., the cleanup recommendations detailed by the United States Environmental Protection Agency are well above and beyond what most people are aware of or prepared to do. This includes immediate evacuation, ventilating the room for several hours, shutting off central heating and cooling to avoid mercury dispersion, collecting all 